Thursday, Thursday, Thursday! Prepare to have your minds annihilated as Patreon proudly presents the Creators Collective Podcast, featuring the Breaker of Boards, James Wright, the Melder of the Metal, Zach Herber Holmes, and the Leveler of Lumber, William Walker. The first five live listeners will get the free special bonus of having their questions answered on air. Now on with the mayhem! And welcome back to another Creators Collective. We are having a lot of fun here. I hope you guys like the, uh, the new intro. Or, uh, <laughs> I think we're having a little too much fun with those. But uh, yeah, those are put together by uh, Jason Wright, my brother. He does uh, for uh, books and things like that and does a phenomenal job. So yeah, if you have any ideas for uh, intros, let us know. Maybe we'll throw one in the future. Or, or you know what? If somebody feels like taking the... The liberty of making one themselves it's yes. entertaining and slightly comical in some regard there's a good chance we'll use it <laughs> i honestly thought that you're joking about doing those intros yeah. where'd we you guys go you guys there? what's that <laughs> i thought we were joking about doing those intros when we first started talking about it and that it just kind of became a reality yeah so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so what are you guys cool. been up to what's new well i've been actually James? Uh, Finishing up the side table, I, uh, I uh, got the plans all done for them and finalized, and so those are released on my website. And so I've had a lot of people clamoring for those now that I'm about halfway through the the build and the videos. But that uh, table it, is ridiculously awesome. Like I saw a picture yeah. of that, and well, thank you. It was uh, that's it's just so great. Like the um, <laughs> the joinery on it. I didn't realize that it wasn't. Uh, I was I was checking out the joinery and I'm like, God, that is just so cool. The offset like dowel pins and screw mm. and then whatever you call those things. But <laughs> uh, it's just very, very, very refined. Like it's simple, intricate, and and there's no glue. Yeah, I I re didn't realize that until afterwards. But it's just such a nice looking piece. I saw I that and then I'm like, a, as if a shaker made mission furniture. Yeah, I saw that and I thought, like, I realize why James doesn't try and sell the things that he makes. Because I, I was, I showed it to my wife and I'm like, this guy doesn't even sell the stuff. And here's why. Do you know how much money I would want if I built that? <laughs> <laughs> like, it would be completely unreasonable. Yeah, I did the, the calculation on it. If, if I were to sell it and, and paid myself about $25 an hour, it would be worth about 3500 yeah, I believe it. So, wow. Yeah, not too many people want to pay for that. But uh, it turns out to make a fantastic Christmas present. Who, you're giving that thing away? I gave it to my parents. So. Oh my God. What's wrong with you? <laughs> it pays to be good friends. <laughs> I mean, that's that's like one of those pieces that I would expect to see, you know, when you go to like a like a furniture exhibit or like a museum that has like period furniture. And you look at the stuff that's like, this was in George Washington's some room in his mansion or something. Um, like, you know, you see all the old furniture and stuff. I mean, that's that's like the quality. That's one of those things that I feel like in 100 years, it'll it'll be on display somewhere. It's just a gorgeous piece. Very cool. Original one I, by right. Yeah, I haven't seen the uh, I haven't seen that layout of, of joiner either. So anyway, I, I was really impressed when I saw that. <laughs> I'm hoping to build a, a full bedroom set like that soon. Um, and actually have the, the the two side tables and then the, the headboard, footboard with all that same joinery. So I think you should make that stuff and put it up on your website for, a, you know, that unreasonable price. Because <laughs> to somebody, it's reasonable. Like, if you understand the amount of work that goes into it, it's not unreasonable. It's just, it's not something you buy because you just need a... Yeah you know, a table. It's something you buy because you appreciate the work that went into it. So, and because it's a James, Wright. Absolutely. <laughs> well, on the, the opposite end of the spectrum, um, I've also been working on a Pinewood Derby car. <laughs> so we go from, you know, high end joinery to, uh, the, uh, the thing that my five-year-old's working on. But, uh, this is, this is fun because this is bring back memories. The, the Pinewood Derby car is the first thing I ever remember making. I mean, other than like model models and Legos, uh, it was the you know, the first thing that I had a chance to run the tools and and make myself, and so I'm I'm trying to give my son that the same benefit of that, uh, except for he is having to do it with all hand tools. 
So he's, oh, wow. he's That's... cutting it all out with a handsaw and planing it down. And there's a um, spray paint last night. When I, in one of the physics courses we, that I took um, in college, like we just spent a couple of days going over Pinewood Derby cars and like the physics behind them. And there's a lot to it. Like it would be, it would be pretty easy to win if you, you know, put some thought into it. Well, I was going to say, have you seen that? Now everyone knows that information because of the internet. And so they've gotten extremely competitive. Yeah. I guess yeah. like what you like the, if you really want to win, what you do is you kind of, you jack the wheels a bit so that only like three of them are actually contacting the ground. Yep. It's less friction. Like there's, there's a, there's a Mark Robert video on it. I think it was Mark Robert. Uh, and like just dem like went to a Pinewood Derby and like just demolished everybody. It was like yeah. the way to win. It's like a, a recipe. But you know what? <laughs> I remember because I remember when I was a kid, um, we did one of those and uh, my, you know how those usually work. Like your dad actually does all of it. It's kind of a project for the parents more than the kids, <laughs> which is fine. Like now that I'm older, it sounds awesome. I, I don't really want a kid, but if, the pinewood making a pinewood derby car would be kind of cool so it's like i guess one of the one of the perks of having children well it all uh, depends on your pack because in ours the rules are incredibly stiff you cannot lathe or touch the wheels with a blade um all four wheels have to be in contact uh there are there's just a bunch of things with uh, different lubricants and things like that that you can't use and it's uh it, it becomes far more strict and mm -hmm. part of that, then the the biggest prize goes to the um, the most ar artistic car. Yeah, I was gonna say. I remember. I was gonna say when I was younger. I remember we won, or I I say we because I didn't really do anything. My dad and I we won the most unique design. It wasn't the fastest, but uh, like I was crushed. I was a kid, so like we we had the races and we didn't win. And I was like super sad. And then they gave an award away to like the most unique design, and we won that. It was a uh, it was an indie car, and it was like perfect. I mean, it looked like an indie car. So it wasn't the fastest, but we. So I think there's there's something to be said for if everybody's just going to be trying to game the the speed system, you can try and beat them in another category. So anyway, my thoughts. Okay. It's a, it's a fun. <laughs> right. the, some people get really serious with it. But. It's the Pinewood Derby podcast. <laughs> well, the other thing I've, I've been working on is uh, I started working on the designs for the Saw Vice, which, which will be the next video series. And I'm, I'm planning on doing uh, more detailed videos like that as well. And actually making That'd a be... Saw Vice that will hold hand saws for sharpening. I, you know cool. what? I'll definitely follow along with that because I sharpen hand saws. <laughs> yeah. I, so I've been, for a while now, uh, I've been reading that book on... Uh, Dick Prenicky, the guy that built a cabin out in Alaska and lived there forever. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he talks about making boards out of trees and obviously that's not news, but have you guys ever done that? Have you ever taken a tree and actually just made like straight lumber out of it? With a, with a portable sawmill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've used a pit saw. Yeah. Turned lumber out. Yeah. I just, I think I that would be, Cool. To, I haven't seen anybody do that. I figured. I figured, James, you probably have a whole series on it that I haven't seen because you have so many videos out. But I've I've seen a lot of chair makers do that. Um, mm -hmm. They'll take a log and you know split it with wedges down the middle and try to find you know like ri ri riven riven wood rived. for rive rived. Is it what's the past tense? Oh, of? Riven. Riven. Yeah. yeah it's riven so wood. You rived the riven wood. Right. Yeah. So the riven riven <laughs> stock. Like home who's done for it's a riven stock for like uh chair spindles and things like that yeah um it's really hmm. cool to watch yeah i think Mona just did uh there's a class in england where you can they give you a log and you make everything out of it you make the, the legs the back the spindles the seat everything comes out of that log that would be really cool to see like i would actually i would i would watch a video on somebody going from you know chunk of, from log to like milled lumber without using power tools. Like that would actually uh, be cool. Uh, Cause I was going to say, do you know? Yeah. Mike <laughs> yes. But he uses tools, power tools. Yeah. Um, not that, I mean, not to discredit that, but I've just, it's something that I haven't seen. I've heard a lot of people talk about it, but I haven't seen it. Well, let me see um, you do it with your teeth. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> I think I, you know, cool. I made that video a while back about making a box with only a chisel. And I get comments on that about once a week where someone's like, well, okay, now let me see you do it without a bench. <laughs> Nothing's ever good enough. Like, okay, fine. Next, I'm going to go into the woods. I'm going to nap my own chisel out of a stone and I'll carve it with my own feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, then people will be saying, do it without a rock. <laughs> Use the force. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I think, uh, I think it'd be cool to try and actually build furniture with only like axes. I mean, yeah. like, how could you? That's like the most manly the, video you could ever make. It's like, tradition. yeah, I would. I, I, there yeah, needs to be Norway like some look down on if you used anything other than an axe for your woodworking. Why isn't there like some giant, some like giant Norwegian ogre who's just making furniture with axes on YouTube? Like, I would totally subscribe, even if it was terrible. I just like the idea. Oh, well, there's Norsemen. They did a, a few that were basically just axes and ads. Yeah. Is, mm-hmm. Do they have a channel? I want to watch. Like, yeah, it's a <laughs> Norseman. Huh. I'm writing that down. I just think that'd be kind of cool. Seems like it'd be a fun, yeah. fun thing to watch. <laughs> well, what do you have, Zach? Um, we're doing the the. What part are we on? The what are you <laughs> working on? Oh, what are we working on? Um, so actually, I've been putting uh, putting some work into my truck lately. Um. The other day, I was just going to kind of take out all the dents in the box of the truck. And it was, we had like a mid 60 degree day here, which was perfect. And um, I figured, you know what, I'm just going to spend the day on it. So I uh, took it down to bare metal, pounded out the dents and uh, shot some primer on it. And then it's funny, every day after I like work on my truck, it actually gets cold the next day, which I love, but it's not good for, you know, paint work and prep work. So, uh, yeah, I've been, been putting some work into the truck, uh, also getting ready to record, uh, a little introduction video for, uh, leather working. I'm just going to do, it's going to be different from my other videos, but I'm just going to do like these little minute, like minimal card wallet things just cause I remember when I started getting into leather work, the leather, like leather working is actually really pretty simple. I mean, there's, there's some fundamental skills and some fundamental tools, but one of the obstacles that I found when I was getting into it is there's so much information out there. Like you can go to 20 different websites and all of them will have different recommendations as far as what you need. And it it gets really confusing. So my idea is just like start with a simple project, get some simple tools as cheap as possible. And that'll kind of open the door to graduate into bigger projects. So that video is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to kind of talk in it and explain things and actually try and educate people who are interested in it. Um, Also, I recently got commissioned by a law firm to do a big sculptural piece. So I am really excited about that. That's the definitely the biggest project in the works. It's going to be about six feet tall. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. Sweet. that's cool what's yeah. uh what's the sculpture what is it is it just like totally whatever you want or is it is yeah like a- I, I had kind of an idea and i ran it by him and uh they seem to like it so it's i'm gonna do like uh you guys know what a taurus is like a kind of a donut yeah mm-hmm. um, yeah kyle toth do- did one what's that kyle toth did uh the double taurus and the taurus segmented turnings things like oh. that Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do a triangle instead of a like if you look at the cross section of the torus, if you cut out a slice instead of doing it in a circle, I'm gonna do it as a triangle. Oh yeah. And I'm gonna have the um, the triangle itself throughout the circle is gonna twist. So it's a Mobius on one side. Yeah, 120 degrees. So I've seen I've seen some other. I mean, it's not like I'm not the first one to do this. There, it's a fairly I don't know if you want to say common, but there's, you know, if you, if you Google search like Taurus sculpture, there's, they're out there, but I just, I saw the space and kind of the surroundings and, and I just got that idea and I ran it by him and, and, uh, they're happy how about do you, it. So how do you bid a job like that? Um, it, you know, it's the same way that I, that I pretty much bid everything else. So. I figure out my materials and then I figure out 
uh, I, it's easiest for me to guess how long a project is going to take in terms of days mm -hmm. uh, versus hours. I have no idea how many hours something can take me, but I can think about the project and say, okay, I can, I can get the base done and I should be able to get the base done in two days. I should be able to get the sculpture done in, you know, four days and, you know, uh, sourcing materials and, and finishing and all of that kind of gives me an estimate on, in terms of how many days the project is going to take me. And then I have a day rate. So I have my materials and then I add that to my day rate. And that's how I, that's how I do all of my estimates. I've tried, I tried a lot of models before I settled on this one and this one just, it feels really good. I, I usually am pretty happy with it's a lot easier to estimate days than hours for me, so sure. it works out really and then you well. Walk, you walk away feeling like you got what you were worth and not yeah. like, I mean, know, oh, I underbid the job. And 24 hours is, is 24 hours, you know? So if, you know, if um, if I have to work a little bit extra to, to keep on track, then, then I do. And if I'm ahead of schedule, then, you know, I can not work as much for the day so it, it usually balances out pretty well and the more you do it the better the better you get at estimating your productivity so yeah fun right on you will oh man i am working on like five projects at once um so i'm still working on the Live Edge Cherry Vanity uh for a client and the whole thing is Live Edge the legs the shelf the top um and these this cherry is just like checked from end to end and the client really wanted to use it because it had sentimental value to them um so i've been stabilizing those with uh bow ties or butterflies or dutchman or whatever you want to call them um then i just went out to my favorite live edge slab sawyer dealer uh, with another client that also is doing a live edge vanity. Um, and we picked out some slabs for him uh, and we ended up getting some spalted hackberry, which is pretty unique. Um, Cause I don't know if you guys have ever seen hackberry, but it's usually pretty stark white, plain, just kind of meh. Um, so my Sawyer throws it in the mud, stacks it without any stickers, checks on it every couple of weeks um, to actually get some spalting without it going too too far into rot. Uh, so that's going to be a fun project. And then also I'm a day early on announcing this, um, but because I don't want to wait a week, I'm going to jump the gun. Um, so I'm doing a project for Grizzly uh, right now where um, there's the three social media guys. So it's me, Kyle Toth and Chris Salamone. Um, our guy at Grizzly, it's the family that started Grizzly. Um, he sent us each some crazy figured funky wood uh, from their private collection. So three different, four different species. And they, we all each got the same amount. And the, the, the challenge was just build something out of this, out of the, the same wood, uh, make videos on it. And people will get to vote on the Grizzly Facebook page on whose video was their favorite or whose project was their favorite. So I got started on that and uh, I'm going to do a pair of bedside tables with a crazy figured babinga top, curly maple aprons and spalted curly western maple tapered legs. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's confusing. <laughs> Five times fast. Yeah, right? Like I got it. I was just like, I don't even know how to describe this piece of wood. Um, there's a lot going on in, in the legs, though, um, with the spalting and with the curly. And uh, it's western maple, so it's that big leaf maple. So the growth rings are huge. They're like, I don't know, like three-eighths of an inch wide. Um, yeah, so it's like I was looking at it, and I was like, holy moly. Um, but uh, and there's in the I'm going to do a drawer in the front of the apron and it's going to be continuous grain pattern and it's going to be the full three and a half inch width. So it should just kind of blend in with the front. Um, <clears throat> and with that, I'm having some design complications of how to support the rest of the table um, with just having small aprons and then a full width drawer front. Um, so James, I was actually going to ask you, 
um, without doing any kind of rails. I'm trying to figure out how to how to support that. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> uh, well, and you're putting a drawer in there too, so that's gonna you, you only have the space between the drawer and the top, unless you're wanting your drawer to run right against the top. Right, exactly. So I was gonna make the drawer box itself a little bit smaller than the drawer front, mm -hmm. um, and then so I was gonna do a sliding dovetail on either side of the drawer in the casework from front to back and then mount some rails on that um, to support the bottom of the drawer and the top of the drawer. So it doesn't tip when it, you know, when you pull the drawer out, it doesn't tip forward. Um, and that's what I've come up with so far. So. Yeah. You're not leaving yourself with much space there. How, yeah. how long is the table? <laughs> uh, the top is going to be 21, 22 inches. I haven't decided. No, oh, that's not bad. On final touch. Yeah. It's just a little side table. Um, it's three quarter inch thick, and I wouldn't put any support on there at all. The top should be strong enough. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. I thought you were talking about like, you know four or five feet. Oh no no no. Um, that would be yeah. That's too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So I'm well, I'm a busy week, guy. This week we are wanting to look back at last year, and uh, I know we're a little late for doing that. Usually it's like the first podcast of the next year. But uh, we wanted to look back at the last year and kind of go over lessons learned, things that we did we were proud of, things we did and were not proud of, and uh, what do we want to change for the next year. So uh, this ought to be interesting because we haven't actually talked over this and discussed it. So <laughs> we're kind of surprising each other with our own responses. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want Ad -lib. to start? Who wants to go first? Uh, how about Zach? This is your idea, right? Oh boy, yeah, your yeah, interview. Yeah, Zach's idea. <laughs> it's a completely original idea. Most people don't do this, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. I, I mean, I can say that 2017 was uh, the best year of my life, and it is 100% due to the fact that um, my wife and the community encouraged me to, or kind of helped. Uh, um, fortify my resolve to leave my job and start my own business. And, uh, it's, I, I still a year, you know, a little over a year later, I still can't believe that this is working. Um, and I'm happy and it's, I mean, I'm, I'm genuinely excited for to start every new day, which is not, not the way I've, I've always been. So, um, yeah, it's it's been incredible. Uh, so what uh, what has been the the least happy or enjoyable over the last year? The least happy is you know the least happy for me is is when I start focusing on when I forget why I'm doing what I'm doing, and when I think about if I focus on the numbers, if I focus on my subscribers and the views and and metrics and the results of why I do what I do when, when my mind starts to drift in that direction, then I get unhappy. Uh, so it's in the last kind of the last quarter of the year was where I started to realize like, you know what, I need to, I need to step back and think about where I am and where I was and how can I not be happy? I, I literally get to do what I want to do every day of the year. It's incredible. I'm on my own schedule um, I get to learn every day. I get to do new stuff every day. And it, it, it really just kind of brings me back. I mean, I've, the fact that, like I said, I get to, I get to do it. I've, I've said it like 10 times already, but it's, it's still, in, it's surreal to me. Um, but I think it's really important because when I started doing this, my goal was, it was essentially, well, I'm miserable working my job. I, you know, before I did this for a living, I, I was, I've never been happy working any job. I wasn't challenging and, um, I didn't feel like I was progressing as, as a human as, you know, I wasn't learning new skills. I wasn't bettering myself. And, um, you know, when I started doing this, it was, it was about why. And I thought, I don't care if I, if I just make enough money to pay my bills, I'll be happy. And I'm doing much better than that. I mean, I'm not wealthy, but, uh, my bills aren't really 
a huge issue anymore. I'm able to put some money away so that we can try and move uh, back to Oregon. <laughs> but uh, I mean, the, and, and when I focus on that, when I kind of step back and, and, and think about why I did this in the first place, because I love doing it and it's working like it's 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 incredible so so what's your biggest goal for this next year uh just to continue just to continue on the the same trajectory that i'm on and and do what i want to do instead of trying to appease um you know the youtube algorithm or trying to focus on gaining subscribers or how well my videos perform uh as long as I'm paying my bills and getting better and learning and you know, getting better as a creator, that's all I can ask for. I feel like if I focus on why I'm doing what I'm doing, then all the other stuff will come naturally as opposed to forgetting that and focusing on the results. You know, it's kind of a means to an end. Like if I, if I focus on the means, the end will, will come, I think. So that's kind of my, past present and future in a nutshell hopefully what about you will oh wow uh the last year has been pretty great um this i feel like this 2018 is the year of of change for me uh last year was great with my photography business um but also my my creating dogs barking um <laughs> with uh creating uh more of a brand identity for the William Walker company um i i took on a few more commissions and that spurred on more commissions and more commissions and so that's really where i want the brand to go so that was a nice year of growth for me um and it really started 2018 off right where i have like three or four commissions going on at the same time. And hopefully those will spur more, more commissions. Um, so yeah, that was, and my, I guess my goals for 2018 would be to keep growing the William Walker company, letting William Walker photography, letting me be a little bit more selective with the amount of work I take on there so I can spend more time with my family on the weekends because that's really the only time. I mean, we've got, so I've got the mornings with my daughter and then my wife, uh, when she gets home from work, she takes evenings so I can get some work done. Um, and they're really only the only time we get to like go out as a family and have fun and go do stuff. And, um, so I'm, I'm really trying to make a good go of the William Walker company, uh, to spend more time with my family and to feel less stressed out about, you know, having to pay the bills um, by photo- with with photography. So, cool. what was your least favorite thing of last year? Uh, figuring out the work life balance. <laughs> um, you know, trying to get dinner on the table, but also knowing that I needed to be in the shop finishing up a project for a client because they were paying me and it wasn't just for fun anymore. Um, you know, and it actually did have a deadline. Uh, and not, I'm not complaining about the project being paid for the project and, it, and woodworking not being fun anymore. I was I'm really more complaining about, or I'm really more stressing about the, the work-life balance, just feeling guilty about being in the shop when I could be spending time with my family versus, you know, making excuses to not get in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Cool. So how about you, James? Well, uh, for me, this last year has been uh, an interesting one. It was my second year with Wood by Wright, but the the first year where I've actually tried to make it into a, a, a serious business. And uh, I, I hit many of my goals and missed many of my goals. But oddly enough, the goals that I missed were the goals that didn't matter as much. Um, like I was, I was intending to be at 50,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. Well, I hit 43, I think, by the end of the year. And, I, you know, th- that was good, uh, but it wasn't what I was expecting. But on the other hand, I surpassed my income goals. I surpassed my, my video creation goals. I surpassed my, my project goals. Um, and so I, I, I guess I have to change my rubric. Um, and not be focusing so much on the 
the, the, the metrics that don't matter and start looking more at the things that do matter um, and the, the actual output, output of it. And much as it was Zach said, you know, one of the, the main focuses of my channel is the fun of woodworking. And I, I, I get a lot of people talking to me about why I do things the hard way um, or why I do it that method when there's another method that would be easier and faster. And I think that's a lot because I just want to do things that I find to be fun. Um, and a lot of times those are the difficult methods. Those are the methods that make you think and make you have to uh, have to hash it out and figure it out. And they may be more difficult, but they're more enjoyable because you're becoming more of the work. You're, you're, you're becoming more connected to the work you're working on. Um, and I think that's one of my, my biggest goals for the next year is I really want to focus on that message um, through my projects. Um, I think the, the the best thing that's happened to me this last year is figuring out the types of videos I want to do because they were kind of a mishmash of everything, doing you know long formats, doing video discussions, doing restorations. Um, and I like doing that that mishmash, but I want to focus them a little bit more. I want to have, um, like this last month, I've been working on the side table and all the videos have been very long format, detailed videos on the side table. And I want to do more of that and actually take a project and break it down into all of its intricate parts and, and walk people through it step by step. But then in between that to be doing some of the you know quick tip videos and restorations and other things like that. And so I'm trying to work through, I think that's one of my biggest goals for this next year is finding that balance between um, the, the, the big projects and how do I fit in the little projects in between. So yeah, I'm having a little bit of fun. As to the... The worst thing in the shop, um, I think that the biggest thing, the most frustrating thing was how long it took to reset the shop because I, I changed everything from, uh, was at the beginning of the year, I was in a shop that was eight foot by 10 foot. And now I'm in a shop that is 10 foot by 22 feet uh, plus the office space. And that is, that's phenomenal. But changing from one to the other, I was planning on it taking you know, a month or two and it ended up taking the vast majority of the year. Um, I wish that, I wish I had, sped that up a little bit but oh well yeah yeah so. <laughs> tell, yeah tell me about it I, every day i just uh yesterday to get ready for this grizzly project and every time i clean the shop and get everything you know the floors swept things put away things organized i look around the shop and go well I need to reorganize this entire shop, move every single tool, uh, you know, build <laughs> tool walls over here, build a wall here. Oh, why is this in here? Oh, I need to use up all that wood. Uh, so I totally get the, the pains of a, of a bigger shop. <laughs> uh, well, one and of the, as to your... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> one of the big goals I have for this next year is actually to be more... Um, I want to have more audience participation. So I want to go to events where I can meet with the audience and, and talk over things I want to. Um, I want to have a couple times where I invite people over and create videos with uh, either people from the audience or other channels. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to opportunities where I can integrate the audience into the shop because one of the things I'm focusing on my channel is is not being, um, I, like I have no sponsors. Uh, I don't have anyone pay me for my time on videos. And that, Number one is kind of a drain on finances because I could be making a lot more money. But number two, it becomes a lot more fun because uh, I can do things the way I want to do them. Mm -hmm. And I want that feeling of it being a group channel as opposed to uh, my channel with, you know, advertisement uh, that it, it's a slightly different feel to uh, um, to the channel. And so that's that's really what I want to focus on is that that feel. <laughs> Do you, uh, I mean, are you opposed to sponsors? Like if they were relevant, like if Veritas reached out and said, hey, you know, if you use our tools, we'll pay you, you know, X amount of dollars. And that wouldn't really change the projects you'd be doing because you'd still be working with hand tools and doing whatever you wanted. Um, no, I, like, I, I don't turn down free tools if a company wants to send me free tools. Um, that's, I don't consider that to be sponsorship and I don't, I, I only use the tools and the videos that I want to use. And I, I've had companies send me tools that I, they don't fit into my workflow and I don't like them, so I don't use them. And yeah, they sent me tools, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use them. I'm not going to put in my videos. 
Um, so that gives me the, the freedom to do that. Um, whereas if I were to do something um, like uh, what Triton does with, they don't put any requirements, they don't, you don't have to talk about them, they just want you to use them occasionally, um, and, and they pop up in your videos. If there was a channel who wanted to support me in that way, I, I think I could be, I think I could fit that in. Um, but the problem is with, with the hand tool um, companies, they're, they're so small that that's, that's not an option for them. So it's, I don't know of a, of a company that would uh, be able or wanting to do that. All right. Well, what about, what about like tight bond? Because I know tight bond is sponsoring some people now. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. No? All right. Like I got all my glues and my glue bots. So I wouldn't be able to show it off. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but going back to your, uh, what you said about doing things the hard way, because it's, you know, there are easier ways, but this is, this is fun to you. I feel mm -hmm. like we could say the same thing, you know, like why do we cut half blind dovetails when we could use pocket hole screws? Like it's, because it's cooler, it's better, it's more fun, it's it looks more professional. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. A lot of people ask me why. Well, what about pocket holes? I'm like, yeah, I have a love hate relationship with them. Well, that's one of the interesting things with hand tools. Uh, once you once you get a mindset into completely but, hand tools, there are a lot of things that become very easy. Dovetails are incredibly easy and incredibly fast when you're when you're a hand tool person when you don't have a drill. Pocket holes are incredibly difficult for a person without a drill. I mean, doing a pocket hole with a brace is, is not an easy task. Um, and it, it takes more time than it does to cut dovetails. It's, it's, it's really not that difficult of a task. And, you know, a lot of people look at dovetails as this incredibly ornate and high held joinery. Whereas in tradition, dovetails were put there because they were fairly fast and fairly easy and you could, you could throw them into a joint and they were, they were kind of looked down on because you, you, you wanted to hide them. You wanted half blind or the really high end people had full blind dovetails. Uh, and that they were something you, you hid. Whereas now they're, they're like the, this high and mighty thing. But for a hand tool person, they're, they're extremely easy. <laughs> they don't take much time at all. Yeah, it just takes a little practice, right? Well, a little bit, not that much. Yeah, cool. Well, I think we had a couple questions, unless you guys wanted to elaborate further. No, I think we could jump into a question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jonathan24 asks, um, do you have any secrets for creating great videos fast and efficiently? Any tips? I'm the least efficient video producer. So I think uh, I think this one's for you, James, because you put out you know your, your month of videos. Yeah, uh, video every other day. Yeah. So, yeah, you want to take this one, James? Um, I don't do editing that I don't have to do, um, but most of my videos are not artistic. They're not um, you know, the, the cool slides and, and fades and you know, the, the timing to the music. I, I don't do that um, because that that is where your time really gets into editing. Um, I, you know, if I were to do that for a video, I could I could very easily spend you know, 12, 16 hours on editing a video. And uh, I don't have time to do that when I'm putting out a video three times a week or more. Um, so I, I focus on, uh, like I'll have, for one of my average long format videos, I'll have two, maybe three hours worth of footage. Um, and I go through, I put all my clips in chronological order, and then I go through them and I crop out the important items. And I just, you know, chop them down to, five, six, seven second segments or in these long format videos when I'm talking. Um, and then I'll quick splice all those together. And that, that actually doesn't take that much time. That usually is only like 30, 40 minutes to, to run through all the footage that way. Um, I, I, I developed an eye for looking at the, the waveform and the audio file and, and finding what I want just by looking at the waveform, by not looking at the, the image. And that, that's a skill that can be learned fairly quickly. Because like mm -hmm. when you're when you're running a tool, the tool makes a waveform that you quickly become to identify. You know, chopping with a chisel or tapping with a hammer or talking, they all look very different in the wave file, and so you can you can very quickly crop things out with that without having to look at them. And then in in my flow, it's fitting them together, seeing how the time looks on it, 
And then at that point, I'll watch through it and see what areas do I need to clip out to make it even shorter. Uh, and I, I try, if it's a long format, I like to keep it between like 15 and 25 minutes. So sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter. Uh, for my average build videos where I do a voiceover, um, those, I, I try to keep those around 12 minutes. Uh, but even then I try and put in a lot of information in the, the voiceover. So it's, I think the, the, the best advice I can give you is um, edit more. <laughs> the, the, the more often you edit, the more you, you just naturally will find little things that make you a little bit faster. And the more you edit, the faster you'll become. And, and now after what, 420 some videos on this channel, um, I've, I have insane. all these tiny little things that I do that I don't think about that are just, you know, part of the, and now one of my long format videos, um, a fast one, I'll usually have it edited in about two hours. Um, a longer one might be four hours or more. Um, but you know, in average editing, that's, that's pretty darn fast. So, yeah. You guys, I, I would say, I would say the most time consuming thing for me is because I do that cinematic artsy fartsy whatever um, is finding a track to suit the mood of the of what kind of mood I'm trying to set with the video. So, like because it's time, everything's you know dark earlier. Um, it's cold. You know I'm wearing darker colors in the shop. I'm wearing jackets. It just feels you know kind of more somber um so i try to fit kind of that mood right now but in the summer when everything or the spring when everything gets bright and happy and i'm wearing short sleeves and it's uh, just finding the track to suit the mood that i'm trying to uh trying to create but then once i get into editing i mean i if i edited and just put my head down and edited i could probably get a video edited within two hours and then do my script and voiceover but I usually get halfway through if I'm like really just chugging along, trying to get something out. Um, because like James said, you know, I edit a lot with the waveform. You know, if I'm chopping a mortise or something, you can see the spikes on the waveform for, mm -hmm. you know, every strike of the mallet. Mm -hmm. um, and then I look at the waveform of the, the soundtrack that I'm using and, you know, you can kind of see the beat and kind of, you know, I don't, I used to be like, super you know everything has to be perfectly on time but then i kind of changed my my format and changed the style of track that i was using um to where now you know as long as it's close and then i use you know visual transitions to the next scene um i've gotten really really quick with with that but i'll get halfway through an edit and decide nah i don't really like this track or eh, this isn't really going the way that i want and scrap the whole edit and start over and that's my biggest <laughs> flaw <laughs> is is i'm like well i'm bored with this now so that means my audience is going to be bored with this so start over and make it better i don't know zach so, how about you what's your workflow oh sorry so you you do your your editing and then add in your voiceover and and your 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 words yep because uh, i always when i'm when i'm cutting things together i'm i'm running through what i want to say in the cut and then when mm -hmm. I do my voiceover, I, I literally will do it in one take. I'll start up Audacity and then have the video running and I'll just talk through the video. So I actually write a script. Otherwise, I kind of bumble my way through it. So and, like uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like a lot of people, I get lots of comments that I should be, you know, narrating. I should be a narrator or I should be narrating films. Uh, or reading audiobooks, which I don't think my voice is like that, but other people, some people do, I guess. I don't know. Um, but so I try to make it, I try to make everything visually appealing first and then try to fit my script to what I think look, what would be a standalone video on its own without a voiceover and then kind of supplement the video with talking about what I'm doing or problems that I ran into or jokes. <laughs> So yeah, I, I've got. I was talking to Chris Salamone about this. He does it. He kind of writes his script first, and then makes his video to his script. Where I do it the opposite way. Hmm. Seems like it'd be hard. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess a lot of people when they do the cinematic, the, the script is the very first thing they write, 
and uh, we'll be actually thinking about the script while they're building the project. And then once they have the script written out, then they'll find the, the video clips to fit into the script. Huh. Yeah, I, that seems because I'm a very visual person. So that's like I'm a visual learner. I'm a visual professional. I'm a yeah. creative professional. Um, so I just, I don't know. Um, and actually, I want to run this by you guys to see if it's an awesome idea or like completely not a good idea. Um, I want to do a video in the very much like the planet earth style where, you know, like the full on David Attenborough, you know, like behold the nat the native woodworker in this natural habitat, <laughs> like <laughs> you know, and make like a natural <laughs> habitat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, and like make a box or something thing like a jewelry box and be like you know you know trying to attract a mate he makes a you know an offering yes, and then like yes. give it to her like in like total like caveman style like, ooh, uh, ooh. <laughs> like <laughs> i like it that would be a great yeah. video okay cool i might do it for like valentine's day or something we should we should definitely do that as a, uh, as a collab speaking yeah. of valentine's day i forgot to mention i just put out a, a valentine's -y themed video sort of yeah the vase was so. sweet that was that was a lot of fun. I did uh, I did the blacksmith roses like a year ago, but I, I I've kind of changed the way that I build them, and uh, so I wanted to showcase that. And I've had this idea for a vase in my mind for a while. It's like a silhouette, like a bunch of hollow cylinders that form a vase. So um, yeah, that was that was a fun build. And, uh, and yeah. Oh, I, I <laughs> I haven't watched the I haven't watched the video yet, but I saw the thumbnail. Um, and the roses they they look a little different than the way you used to make them, right? They're they're a little bit different, yeah. Or they you use the torch a little bit different. Yeah. yeah, the torches I used to do them all in the forge, and actually, my favorite part of the whole process is like if you see in the video, like once I get the petals all bent into shape, is like with the oxyacetylene torch, just a little tip on it, you can heat up the ends of them and kind of crinkle and curl them, and it just it's just such like a cool process. Even, I mean, it looks neat in the video, but even when you're doing it, it's just, I don't know. It just seems to give them a lot of life. It's really fun. Yeah. Like it's, I don't know. Working with hot metal is always, always satisfying. So. Yeah. I want to get into metal turning, but I don't have a metal lathe yet. Um, but I think it'd be cool to make like your own hardware. Yeah. Like knurled brass knobs and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I wish I had more shop space. I am like, I am hurting so bad for space right now. I mean, it's been bad for a long time, but it's just, I mean, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. I keep getting more tools, which is great. But I mean, I seriously have to start my day by pushing half of my possessions out in the driveway just so that I can move in my shop. <laughs> so, but we've got uh, a joke of the week. Yes. How do you make your own flame birch? You light it on fire. But a bum. <laughs> you you can blame Joel Fogrot. <laughs> I think it's uh, like uh, Fe Fe Joel Fagerholt. Fagerholt. That sounds that sounds a lot better. <laughs> Fagerholt or Fogerholt? I'm not sure what the umlau does to it i'm not i think I it's a speak. oh like oh <laughs> like oh <laughs> so what are you watching will uh i am watching and reading um so i'm watching uh duquette and wolf furniture oh, makers yes. yeah they're like man oh. they're they make museum quality just amazing uh traditional furniture their technique is just flawless like the like the clawed foot uh on the on the legs of a uh, yeah, they, of a piece they work like full time and will produce a piece of furniture every six months and put that much detail into it it's just holy crap i know i'm Man, subscribed to them but their it's their pieces are just amazing so i was doing some more studying on i was just looking at side tables and casework and fitting those drawers that i was talking about and uh, thought i'd check them out to watch one of their builds on uh, you know, a side table, hall table, whatever. And then that just sucked me right back into 
like watching everything that they do and you're just like oh it's it's total total wood porn yeah <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading, um, I just found this website called, uh, it's the woodarchivist.com. Um, and every woodworking magazine, you know, popular woodworking, fine woodworking, wood magazine that have plans for pieces, they scan those plans and then it's just this huge archive of uh, like a gazillion uh woodworking plans. Uh, and I rarely build off of a plan, but it gives me ideas for say like that drawer, you know, I'll just look at the drawer detail of how, yeah, you know, somebody else has done it um, and then make the project my own. But uh, that's been a great resource. Cool. Well, I've been watching um, Ben Prowl um, and he has like 400 subscribers, something like that, but uh, definitely like the next Kyle Toth. Uh, <laughs> he, he turned this hollow form vase, at least what it looks like about three foot long, massive um segmented vase and then he took it over to the bandsaw and cut it in half and then cut those halves in half so he had ended up with quarters and then turned them into these corner shelves that got mounted on the wall it was just like this this mind-blowing video of amazing woodworking and he's got 400 subscribers it's just it's it's phenomenal so definitely definitely check him out i'm gonna have to check that out that sounds awesome and i'm gonna tell kyle you said that <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the the videos reminded it was very 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 familiar of of a Kyle Toth video, and so it was uh, it was it was phenomenal. What about you, right Zach? Um, so I actually do have something. Uh, I did watch a little bit of YouTube this week. Oh, not a book. Not a book this week. I'm still <laughs> reading the same one. I'm almost That's done funny. with it, but uh, so I have an actual YouTube recommendation. I stumbled upon. Um, uh, I guess it's more like it's kind of like mechanical sculptural stuff. The guy's name is Arthur Ganson, A R T H U R G A N S O N. Um, just it's just crazy to watch the way these things work. They're just abstract mechanical sculptures, and you watch them and just some of the mechanisms that he uses, uh, like weird gears, and it's just it's crazy. It's just, I mean, it's interesting to see the way the guy's mind works to put this stuff together. Uh, and I think one of his pieces actually was really popular. I think I saw it a while ago, like a year ago, it made its rounds on Facebook or something. He's the guy that did the, the gear reduction. He did like some sculpture that was like 12 planetary gear reduction sets. And the last gear was actually is some it's cemented in well concrete because the gear reduction is so low. I mean, and it's funny, you can see the first gear spinning at, I don't know, probably like 30, 40 RPMs, and it goes through all these other gears. And I think it takes like hundreds of thousands of years for the final drive to get, or the final gear to get one revolution. So he just put it in concrete. <laughs> so it's, it's just like the, just the conceptual stuff. I mean, it's more art than practicality, but just, it's it's pretty pretty entertaining stuff. So that's that's mine for the week. That's sweet. Well, what uh, what do you have for your tools of the week, Zach? Oh, did I write anything? Somebody yeah, else go. Respirator. Oh yeah. Okay, I do have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so since I have been uh, focusing a fair amount of attention on my truck, and I'm working with uh, urethane primer and paint, which is pretty much uh, liquid death has a bunch of really, really, really bad chemicals in it. And uh, if anybody else has a beard, they know that normal respirators don't work very well. So I tried, uh, I splurged and bought the 3M full face respirator, um, which covers your eyes and, and all of that. The seal's a little bit different and it, it works way better. It's still not 100%. Um, I, I trimmed down my beard a little bit, but it's, I mean, if I plug the holes on it, I would suffocate. I mean, there's just the slightest amount of, of leakage around my, my beard. It's really, um, What's significantly that? better than, than the, the nose and mouth one that I've been using. So that, and I'm spraying outside. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's 
it was a it was a solid investment. I think it was about like a hundred dollars, and I'm very glad that I did it. Well, that's cheap. So yeah, I mean the the positive air pressure ones. If you're doing this stuff in a closed environment and uh, or doing a lot of it, that's definitely the way to go. But those are like a thousand bucks, and yeah. I'm not going to do that to shoot one vehicle. So. <laughs> What about you, Will? Uh, my favorite tool are shaker pegs. Um, so I bought a box of 50 shaker pegs. No, I did not turn them um, because it was $17, I think, to buy a box of 50. And my shop time is worth more than that. Um, I bought the box of shaker pegs for a project for the scarf hanger that I talked about last week that my wife made. Um, and had a bunch left over. And as I was cleaning the shop yesterday, I was just putting shaker pegs everywhere to hang things off of. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got the two P ten CP uh, CA glue kit, uh-huh. with the, the accelerator gel, the thick, the medium, and thin, and it comes in this box that wouldn't fit in any of my cabinets because it was too long and too tall. Um, and so I just started. So I put a shaker peg on the side of a a finishing rack that I had made a while ago to hold finishing supplies and just hung it on that. And uh, and I'm putting them everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Well, mine is actually the uh, number four bench plane. Uh, I I get a lot of people asking me in my videos, why did you use the the bench plane rather than a block plane and you're doing this or that? And I have to say, you know, once you get used to using a plane, you, you just reach for it and grab for it and... Uh, my number four is really that plane that I just I always reach for. It's a it's simple, it's lightweight. I can do most all of my planing work with it, and uh, it, you know it, it's it's extremely versatile. Um, it's it's just there. It's easy to use, and it can do most anything I want to. So yeah, I like the simple number four bench plane. One of my favorites. I have a four and a half. I don't technically have a four, but that's just wider, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Half inch wide like or three quarter inch wider. Okay. Half inch. Something like that. Five eighths. Let's say five eighths. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool. Well, this has been a, uh, another uh, fun time with the Creators Collective. I do want to say a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon, uh, particularly uh, Make, Build, Modify, Master of None, and Debbie Brooke. Thank you so much. This has been a uh, phenomenal time. Also, if you'd like to uh, follow in my dogs. <laughs> and the dogs want a good thank you too so thank you dogs William's parents dogs <laughs> um, if any of you would like to follow us you can find uh, James Wright on Wood by Wright on YouTube or anywhere else ZH Fabrication with Zach Herberholz wherever you want to and William Walker Company YouTube and uh, you know, wherever the cool people are so that's about it for today <laughs> and until next time have a wonderful day adios guys see you later <laughs>